We are already at the seventh episode of Navigating Linear Algebra, and in this episode, we are going to devote our time to introducing ourselves to the notion of determinant. Before we get started with the rigorous definition of determinant, let us first try to informally and geometrically understand what determinant is going to do. In particular, the determinant is really going to represent the change in volume and orientation of the space. What do I mean by this? Well, first let us suppose we have a linear transformation from R2 to R2 given by the matrix 1, negative 1, 2, 1. Now realize that this particular unit square, this square is being mapped to this parallelogram in R2. Now realize that this square of course has area 1 and this parallelogram is going to have some area A. And what I claim when I say change in volume here, of course we should interpret this as change in area for R2, what I'm saying is that the area is exactly going to be multiplied by the determinant of the matrix in question. And in fact, as you can check later or now, determinant of this matrix is exactly 3, so the area of this parallelogram is in fact 3. Now let us talk about the change in orientation. Let's say we have a matrix like this, which is sending the basis vector E1 to E2, E2 to E3, and E3 to E1, as you can check by just looking at the columns. Now, of course, this map is going to send the unit cube just simply to itself. So when it comes to change in volume, there is none. The volume is staying the same. However, when it comes to the orientation of the space, you clearly see that the basis vectors are being shuffled around. And how we measure this change in orientation is as follows. You start with E1, E2, E3, and you think about how you can get to E2, E3, E1 by swapping the basis vectors. What I mean by this is that if you want to get to E2, E3, E1, then we can start by swapping E1 and E2. So we have E2, E1, E3, and then we can swap the second and the third element to get E2, E3, E1. And what we're going to say is that if we had to do an even number of swaps, then the orientation is plus 1, and if we had to do odd, then it's minus 1. So here, since we had to do two swaps, we are going to say that the determinant of this matrix is just plus 1. Now, a natural question that you may have at this point is that surely switching E1 and E2, then switching E2 and E3 is not the only way. It's not the only way to get E2, E3, E1 from E1, E2, E3. What if there was a way where you can get to E2, E3, E1 using odd number of swaps? Then the determinant would have to be plus 1 and minus 1, and this obviously seems to be a problem. But I claim that something like this is impossible. And this is one thing that we are just simply going to take for granted throughout this video. And that's that if you start with E1, E2 and all the way to say En, and then we apply some permutation sigma, where a permutation is simply a bijection from 1 to n to itself. For example, the permutation here is the one that sends 1, 2, 3 to 2, 3, 1. But in general, we are going to be sending E1 to En to E sigma 1 all the way to E sigma n. And I claim that if you can get to E sigma 1 to E sigma n using even number of swaps, then it's impossible to get to E sigma 1 to E sigma n using odd number of swaps. And conversely, I claim that if you can get to E sigma 1 to E sigma n using odd number of swaps, then it's impossible for you to get to E sigma 1 to E sigma n using even number of swaps. And I in fact encourage you to try to prove this if you'd like, but if you continue with mathematics beyond linear algebra, you're probably going to see a proof of this in, for example, a combinatorics class or a group theory class. So we'll take this fascinating fact for granted, and let me quickly mention here that we're just going to call this plus 1 or minus 1 as the sign of the permutation sigma. Okay, now let's talk about how we're actually going to define determinant. So let's say we are given a vector space V, which is just Fn, where F is a field. Now something to realize here is that if you have an n by n matrix, then we can really think of each column as being a vector. So the first column can be vector V1, second column can be V2 all the way to Vn. So if we are evaluating the determinant of uh, such a matrix, you can really think about determinant as being a function from Vn to the underlying field F. So we're going to start with n vectors, which are going to be the columns of the matrix, and we are simply outputting a value, which is, of course, the determinant. 
And now we're going to define determinant by requiring it to satisfy three properties, the first of which is going to be multilinear. And what multilinear means is that if we're going to fix any n minus 1 vectors here, so for the sake of illustration, let's say we're fixing v2 all the way to vn, then we naturally have a map that simply sends v1 to determinant of v1 all the way to vn. And what multilinear means is that this map is going to be linear. So of course, we didn't have to fix v2 to vn, we could have fixed the v1, v3 all the way to vn, such that now you have a map from v2 to the determinant, and we require that map to be linear and so on. Secondly, we are going to ask the determinant to be alternating. And what alternating means is that if you have two equal columns, then determinant is just going to be zero. So for example, if v2 and v1 happen to be the same, then the determinant is going to output zero. And finally, we are going to ask the determinant of the identity matrix to be 1. To gain some intuition on this definition, let's say we are in R3 and we have, say, a linear map that's sending E1 to this vector u, E2 to some vector w, and E3 to some vector v. And just for the sake of this example, let us assume that u is in the span of E1, so that u has coordinates a1, 0, 0, and w is in the span of E2, such that you have the 90 degrees here, and w is of the form 0, 0, 0,82, 0. And let's assume that v has a positive z coordinate. u, w, and v are going to form a parallel pipette that looks like this. And if our geometric intuition for determinant were to be correct, then the determinant of u, w, v better be the volume of this parallel pipette. And what is the volume of this parallel pipette? Well, if the height of this parallel pipette happens to be a3, then the determinant has to be a1 times a2 times a3, simply because the base has area a1 times a2, and our height is a3. So let us check if this is actually the case. To see this, first to realize that if we have this vector v prime, that's just 0, 0, 0, a3, so that in particular v and v prime lie on the same plane, so they lie on the same plane here, that looks like this, then we can surely go, go from v prime to v by adding some scalar multiple of u and by adding some scalar multiple of w. In other words, we can get to v from v prime by adding some, say, b2u and some b3w. Now, since determinant is multilinear, we can think about fixing u and w, and we're now going to have a linear map in terms of this final coordinate. So in particular, we are going to get determinant of u, w, v prime plus b2 times the determinant of u, w, u plus b3 times the determinant of u, w, w. And now by this alternating property, we look at this determinant of u, w, u. So we have two same columns here. That's simply going to be zero. And similarly, determinant of u, w, w is going to be zero. So what we have left is really the determinant of a matrix given by a1, 0, 0, 0, a2, 0, and 0, 0, a3. So what is the determinant of this matrix? Well, again, if we fix the final two vectors, then we have a linear map in terms of the first vector. So we know this is equal to a1 times the determinant of 1, 0, 0, 0, a2, 0, 0, 0, a3. But of course, we can make the same argument for the final two vectors to get a1, a2, a3 times the determinant of 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. And of course, by the final property of the determinant, we know this entire thing is 1. So we do indeed get a1, a2, a3. I hope that gives you some intuition over this determinant definition. But before we go on, let's also check this definition against one of our examples that we started off with. And we argue that to get e2, e3, e1, we have to do two swaps. So e1 and e2, then e2, then e3 would be an example. So we want to show that the determinant of this matrix is in fact plus one. Is this actually true? In other words, we are really asking if we have determinant of, say, v1, v2, v3, and we make one swap, say, v1 and v2, to get v2, v1, v3, then we would expect us to have a minus determinant of this matrix. In other words, we are expecting the sum of these two numbers to be zero. 
And it may not be obvious at first sight why this is true, but there is actually a very nice way of showing this, and that's to add two determinants of matrices given by V1, V1, V3, and V2, V2, V3. And here, of course, because the determinant is alternating, this determinant is zero and this determinant is zero. And we now see by multilinearity that this thing is simply determinant of V1 plus V2, V1 plus V2, then V3. This you should be able to easily check just by definition of multilinearity. But now by alternating, we have two same columns. So this thing is at zero exactly as we wanted. So this exactly means that, for example, in this particular example, that determinant is going to be plus one. Now let us move on to asking a very natural question of, does determinant even exist? After all, we are saying that we have this function from Vn to f that satisfies all of these. And you may ask, why does such a function even have to exist? But I claim, and this is a fascinating claim, that there is one and only one determinant. So there is exactly one function determinant that satisfies all of these. To see why this is the case, let us try to evaluate the determinant of, say, A, B, C, D. So this is a 2 by 2 matrix. Here, the first column of this matrix is A, E1 plus C, E2, whereas the second column of this matrix is B, E1 plus D, E2. Oh, and I guess I should point out that I'm writing this straight line to denote the determinant of the matrix. And now realize that by multilinearity, once again, that this entire matrix is going to be equal to some of these four numbers. So the first one I'm getting by taking AE1 and BE1 to get AB times E1, E1. The second term is coming from AE1 and DE2. So we have A times D and then E1, E2 and so on for the next two. And here now invoking alternating, we know this thing is zero. We know this thing is zero. So we get AD times the determinant of the identity matrix, which is 1, and we get CB times the determinant of E to E1, and of course, to get to E to E1, we just swap E1, E2, so the sign of the permutation is minus 1, so we have AD minus BC. And this is probably a formula that you are familiar with for 2 by 2 matrix. Okay, now let's try to generalize this to n by n matrix. So let's say we have a matrix whose first entry is a11, then we have a12, a13, all the way to a1n. And in the second row, we're going to have a21, a22, all the way to a2n. And we are going to have our final row, which is going to be an1, an2, all the way to ann. Given this matrix, what is going to be the determinant? We see that in this AD times determinant of E1, E2 and CB times determinant of E2, E1, that we are really selecting one entry from each column. So for example, in AD times E1, E2, we selected A for the first column, then D for the second column. And for E2, E1, we selected C for the first column, then B for the second column. And hopefully it's not too hard to convince yourself that this is going to hold in general. So here we're going to have some over all possible permutation sigma. So here we're permuting n numbers. And we're going to pick one entry from each column. And that entry is of course given by the permutation. So we're going to first pick from the first column sigma 1. Then we're going to pick from the second column some sigma 2 entry. And so on until we pick sigma n n. And then we are going to have a determinant of E sigma 1 all the way to E sigma n, which is, of course, the sign of the permutation. And once we have this expression, then you can go through the list and you can check that this is, in fact, multilinear alternating and the determinant of identity is 1. So we have, in fact, shown that there is exactly one determinant. Now, something I want to point out is that perhaps in high school, you have seen a different definition of determinant. And let me just illustrate this for a 3x3 three three matrix. You may have seen a formula where you expand along the first row to obtain that the determinant of this 3x3 three three matrix is A times determinant of a 2x2 two two matrix given by all entries outside the row and column of A. So we have determinant of EFHI. Then we always switch sign. So instead of adding, we're going to subtract and we're going to do B times a determinant of the matrix given by D, F, G, I. Then we go back to plus C times the determinant of D, E, G, H. And to check that this is in fact a valid formula, 
you can, for example, show that for a 2 by 2 matrix, this definition gets you the correct determinant. And then for a 3 by 3 matrix, you can simply check this forces the determinant to be multilinear. For example, if I scale the first column by 2, then we're going to have 2a here, 2d, 2g here, and 2d, 2g here. So since this was a valid definition for a 2 by 2 matrix, we can simply factor 2 out here, and we see that the entire thing is 2 times the original determinant. And in general, you can check this definition gets you a multilinear determinant, as well as alternating and the determinant of the identity matrix is 1. So that gets you that this is in fact a valid equation. And here I'll point out, that there are all ways of expanding the determinant using the second row, or the third row, or even first column, second column, or third column, and how to do so is going to be one of the problems for this episode. To continue, I want to raise a very interesting and important question. Let's say we have a matrix that looks something like this, and let's say we consider the transpose of the matrix, and the transpose, often denoted by a t, if a is the matrix that we started off with, is the matrix obtained by simply flipping the rows and columns of the matrix. So instead of a, b, c being the first row, we're going to have a, b, c be the first column, and so on. So we have d, e, f here, and we have g, h, i here. And looking at this definition, you may suspect that determinant of a and a transpose are very intimately related. Because, for example, one of the sum ends for this particular determinant can be obtained by, say, we pick g from the first column, b from the second column, and f from the third column. So we have g times b times f times the determinant of e3, then e1, then e2. But the important point is we can also obtain g times b times f for the transpose by simply picking b here, f here, and g here. So we also have g times b times f, but now we have the determinant of e2, e3, e1. So I wrote the matrices down like this. And of course here, if you call this matrix B, then this matrix is B transpose. And now something to realize here is that for a matrix B of the form E sigma 1 all the way to E sigma n for some permutation, we in fact have that B transpose is equal to B inverse. And this is very easy to check. We, you just multiply this matrix by this matrix and just check that you do indeed get the identity matrix. And what that's telling us here is that if you have a permutation here, sigma, given by sending 1 to 3, 2 to 1, and 3 to 2, here we're going to have the inverse permutation. So now we're going to have that 3 goes to 1. So we're going backwards. So 3 goes to 1, 1 goes to 2, and finally 2 is going to go to 3. And let us ask, what is going to be the sign of sigma inverse? Well, for sigma, we start with e1, e2, e3, and we want to get to e3, e1, e2. And to do so, we can first swap e1 and e3, and then we can swap the first two entries, as you can check, to get e3, e1, e2. But for sigma inverse, we are going to do the opposite. We are now going to start with e1, e2, e3, and we are going to reverse. We are going to reverse all the swaps. So if we swapped like this, and then like this, to get to e3, e1, e2, to go backwards, you're going to start by swapping like this, and then you're going to swap the final two entries. And you can pause here and check that this does indeed get us e2, e3, e1. But the main point is, since you're just doing the swaps backwards, the number of swaps stays the same. So if we had an even number here, then we have an even number here, and vice versa. So we see that determinant of this matrix and the corresponding determinant of this matrix are actually going to be the same. And of course, this implies that determinant of A is equal to determinant of A transpose. Beautiful. We're going to use this elegant property pretty soon. But for now, let us move on to talk about another property of determinant, and that's the determinant of some matrix is going to be zero if and only if. A is not invertible. And to get some intuition about this, let's say we have some matrix A that's going from R2 to R2 that's not invertible. Then the rank of A is either going to be 0 or 1. So we know that the image of A is either going to be 0 dimensional or 1 dimensional. But if the image is 0 or 1 dimensional, then that certainly has area of 0. So we would expect the determinant of A to be 0 as well. To prove this more rigorously, 
for example, for the backwards direction. So let us assume that we have a matrix that's not invertible. And I guess I should have pointed out here that the matrix A is an n by n matrix. Now the fact that A is not invertible implies that the column vectors of A are linearly dependent. So if you have V1, V2, all the way to Vn, forming the column vectors of A, we know V1 to Vn are linearly dependent, which means there exists some vector that we can get to using other vectors via vector space operations. So for example, without loss of generality, maybe we have vectors V1, V2, and V3 is A1, V1 plus A2, V2. And now once we have something like this and we are taking the determinant, of course, by multilinearity and alternating, we are going to get this equality where these determinants are of course at zero. So we do in fact get zero as we desired. So we have this backwards direction. Now, before we dive into the forward direction that if determinant of A is zero, then A is not invertible. I want to talk about the notion of elementary matrix. To get elementary matrices, what we do is we start with the identity matrix, say a 3x3 three three identity matrix, and then we are going to apply exactly one elementary row operation. And in case you've forgotten, I wrote down the elementary row operations. The first, we can scale a row by a non-zero scalar, we can add a scalar multiplable row to another, or we can switch two rows. So for example, if we add two times the second row to the first row, then we get 1, 2, 0. 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Now a beautiful fact about elementary matrices that I encourage you to check is that if we multiply this elementary matrix to the left by any matrix, say A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I, then we are actually going to apply that elementary row operation. So we are going to get, when we do this, we are going to add two times the second row to the first row of our matrix to get A plus 2D, B plus 2E, C plus 2F, and then D, E, F, G, H, I. And this you can check by just multiplying the matrices, and I really encourage you to at least pause the video here and check this particular one. But you should also be able to check that this holds for any elementary matrix. And why am I talking about elementary matrices here? Well, there are two properties of elementary matrices that we are going to use. The first thing I wanted to realize is that if I call this elementary matrix M, then determinant of M is going to be non-zero. To see why, let's just go down the list. First, if we are scaling a row by a non-zero scalar, so we have something like, let's say, A times E1, so we're scaling the first row by A, and we have E2 and E3. Then now, because determinant of the transpose is the same as the original determinant, we can in fact think of these rows as columns. So we can just take A outside to get A times the determinant of E1, E2, E3, which is of course 1. So here we are going to get A, and since we started off with a non-zero scalar, the determinant here is non-zero. Secondly, if we are adding a scalar multiplable row to another row, so let's say we have exactly the same case we have here, where we have E1 plus 2E2 as the first row, and then E2, then E3. Again, since the determinant of the transpose is the same as the original determinant, we can invoke multilinearity here to split this as E1, E2, E3, plus 2 times E2, E2, E3. And of course, by alternating, this thing is going to be 0. So we, in fact, get 1. So the determinant of this matrix is going to be 1. Finally, if we are switching to rows, the determinant is just going to be minus 1, which is, of course, non-zero. So we have established this fact. Just as importantly, another thing I wanted to realize is that if M is an elementary matrix, then determinant of M times any matrix is going to be determinant of M times determinant of A. So once again, to emphasize, M here is an elementary matrix, and A here is really just any matrix. And to verify this, it's just the casework once again, you just go down the list and check each case. So for example, for the second case, we want to show that determinant of this matrix is equal to determinant of this matrix times the determinant of this matrix. But we already know determinant of this matrix is 1. We just have to realize that we can apply multilinearity and alternating to the first row here. And you should be able to easily check once again that we do in fact have the equality. And similarly, you can verify the first case and the third case. So you should be able to convince yourself that this equality is true. Now let us revisit what we actually want to prove. We already know that if A is not invertible, then determinant of A is zero. So let us finally show that if A is invertible, 
then determinant is non-zero. Now if a is invertible and we row reduce it to the reduced row echelon form, we know from episode 5 that rank of a is going to equal rank of r. So since a was invertible, rank of a was of course n, so we know rank of r here is n as well. This implies that r is of course equal to the identity matrix. So we know since a is invertible, we can row reduce it to the identity matrix. Which means that if a is invertible, then we left multiply a bunch of elementary matrices, so let's say m1, m2, all the way to m sub n, and this is going to get us the identity matrix. And now what do we know? Let's try taking determinant of both sides. We know this side is going to get us 1, and here, because each one of these is an elementary matrix, we know this thing is going to be determinant of m sub n times determinant of m sub n minus 1, and so on, all the way to determinant of m sub 2, determinant of m sub 1, times determinant of a. And now, the finale, we know all of these determinant is non-zero, and that times determinant of a is 1, which means determinant of a is non-zero, and we have proven this claim. Here, one thing I wanted to think about is that implicit in this proof is really all the ideas that you need to show that determinant of a times b is equal to determinant of a times determinant of b for any n by n matrices a and b. And this is one of the problems for this episode, and I ask you to think about why this is true. Anyway, I hope you have a better understanding over what exactly determinant is, and I will conclude this episode here.